Hi there, class. Uh, <clears throat> welcome back. This uh, uh, this video will cover chapters 12 and 13. Uh, 12 is on international marketing management, and 13 is on international marketing B to C. So with that, we'll jump right in. As always, here's the cliff notes for chapter 12. And we're starting with kind of a history of um, how uh, marketing for multinationals has evolved. So. In the 1970s, the big question was about standardization versus adaptation. And in a lot of ways, this is still the big question. Um, but uh, in the 70s, there were, it's like, is it smarter for us to, to create individual products or to create a, a product that everybody can use universally? Um, in the 1980s, that kind of evolved into globalization versus localization. Do we want to look at individual markets or do we want to try to do more like a Coca-Cola approach where the product in, in the same form fits pretty well every market um, and the, the consumption is done the same way? By the 1990s, um, this was kind of getting refined even a little bit more about global integration versus local responsiveness. So do we try to do something where we have a core that is the same and then we um, uh, add local tweaks uh, to the product. And in a lot of ways, this whole question is still evolving. Um, the, the, um, despite you know, the, the uh, changes of the last year uh, or so against globalization, still the overall trend is for a more globalized world. Um, and in that globalized world, sometimes a country, sometimes political borders aren't the best uh, way to segment. You might uh, find that, that there are other more distinct cultural lines upon which you can segment your market. Um, examples being climate, language group, media habits, age, income. The, there could be other things. It could be um, uh, that you have demographic changes. This is, you know, um, Africa is often looked at as the political lines being not representative of um, the true cultural barriers for the different peoples uh, across Africa because the, the, the political lines were drawn by colonizers and not by the indigenous, uh, the indigenous people. So the, the closer you are to the reality of the people you're trying to serve, the better. Um, one of the advantages of uh, operating your marketing on a global basis is economies of scale. If you can find a way to produce your product um, and you that it includes your packaging, your um, distribution system. If you can do those the same, then you get economies of scale versus uh, trying to do something different for every market. Um, but there's there's some downsides to that too. The other thing is is that as you um, operate globally, um, lessons you learn in one part of the world can transfer to uh, to other parts of the world. And we see this a lot with the export of American management practices around the world. As American multinational companies have uh, expanded around the world, their management practices um, have gone with them. And then the other uh, opportunity is you have a bigger talent pool. So you can draw on the creativity of employees that are, that are hired from all different uh, places around the world. This also, um, you may be able to afford to go after customers that otherwise would, um, would not be profitable to go, out, to go after because your, your basic operation is being supported um, by your core markets. And so that may allow you to, um, to dedicate the resources to reach out to customers that otherwise you would not be able to. Um, the other thing is, is that you get this, diversif this diversification effect. So um, that because your, your revenues are drawn across uh, a, a, you know, the, the globe or across many markets, that decreases your, your susceptibility to um, economic volatility in any one market. Um, so you're able to have a, a more stable uh, operation and a more predictable and stable uh, revenue stream. So I want to talk about stage gates. Stage gates is a project management term, um, and the, uh, what it means is a point at which you decide to, to continue with the project or to abandon the project. So as we look at entering a new market, these three stage gates apply. The first one is initial screening, right? You're going to take a look at the high-level data, um, a, a, a summary look at the details uh, for entering a new country and decide, hey, is, is this worth even considering? If you pass that stage gate, you go to stage two and you start doing deeper analysis. You start saying, well, okay, how much, uh, how, how big is the market in this target? How, uh, how much revenue do we think we could draw from this target? Um, and then if you, if you pass that stage gate, you go to stage three, which is we're going to dig deep and, and try to hammer out all the details before we dedicate a, you know, a huge amount of money 
to a new product entry. Uh, we want to know as much as we can about what to expect and have, have done as, as thorough analysis as possible. <clears throat> and as you look at that, there are these, these are um, four common stages that a company will go through as they're looking to introduce a new product into a new market. We'll go into each one of these in a little bit more detail. So phase one is initial screening. That's part of, um, the, part of step one. Um, we're looking to see if the strengths and weaknesses of our company and our product match up with, uh, favorably with the new market. We want to look at the, the philosophy. Are the people in this new market going to be responsive to what we believe in, in terms of our tribe as a, as a company or our tribe as a product? Um, can we operate in a way that makes sense for us? Um, and and uh, are we pursuing objectives that match what uh, we expect to see in the target country? Now, as we take a, a deeper look, right, we, if we pass uh, phase one, we get to phase two, we're looking at the, the marketing mix, right? This is, this is your four Ps or five if you, if, uh, uh, if you buy my addition of people to your product, place, promotion, um, and price. Look at the uncontrollable factors. Do you remember the concentric circle diagram from uh, some of our early lectures? Um, there's going to be things in the new market that we can't control. Are they acceptable to us? Can we work within those constraints? And then do we have to adapt the product? We're going to talk a, a little bit more about that, but, but um, are the adaptations we'd be required to make, uh, are they acceptable to us or do they make it to where that we can't make money and entering this market with this product? Um, and ultimately, the question is, can we make money? Can we be profitable in the new market? Phase three. So now, now we've done the analysis. We think that we we think we can enter this market profitably. So now, what are the steps that we need to execute in order to to actually do the work to enter the market? So here we're starting to build the plan for how we're going to really do this. And um, this brings us to another level of granularity, right? We're we're looking at this a little bit closer with every step. Um, when we look at entering a market, there are four modes. So these are, these are um, essentially legal structures for how we want to enter the market. We can export, we can enter the market through contractual agreements, we can form strategic alliances, and we can um, do direct foreign investment. Ultimately, the question about these has to do with the equity um, of the players. Do, who owns the operation at each stage and in each country? Um, and that ownership is tied into risk and control. And with risk, that risk is the flip side of the coin of return. So if we take bigger risks, then whatever returns come through, um, more of those belong to us. Um, and the same, by the same token, control is about where does the decision-making authority lie? And these are all key management, uh, management decisions that, that we have to be comfortable with um, before we start an international operation. Um, this is a, a chart from the text, and really, um, in the center, you see internet at the top, direct foreign investment at the bottom. As you go through these stages, right at the top, you have the least risk, least control. Um, so if you sell something on the internet, you have very little control about how it's delivered. Whatever the postal situation is in the target market, that's how stuff is going to show up. Where at the bottom, direct foreign investment, you go to the country, you build a factory, you, you buy, you know, you lease store space, you do tenant improvements, so all of you, everything looks and feels the way you want it to look. But if something goes wrong, um, your investment is at risk. So the lightest risk is at the top, greatest risk at the bottom, also the greatest control. So let's talk about each one of these a little bit. Direct exporting. Let's say that I'm, gonna th I'm going to sell directly to foreign buyers. So um, uh, let's say I'm in the U.S. I want to sell to people in Japan. I expect people in Japan to find my product over the internet. So they're going to the geographic problem of, of uh, discovery is done online. They find my products there. They buy them. I take their uh, their money. The, the foreign exchange is handled by my credit card processing company and. Uh, I take my product to the post office and ship it down to them, or, or UPS or whatever. Um, in that case, I have, you know, in, and the, the great thing about this is that any one of you could set this up in, in a matter of, of days, maybe hours, um, set up an operation where you could be selling online internationally, and you've got an international business. Um, the, and the arm's length uh, nature of that business may be really advantage, a big advantage for you. 
the the thing that I don't have is a lot of control over what the customer's experience is. When my uh, when my product shows up uh, in their mailbox, that's as much control as I have. The unboxing experience that they have of opening that product um, and then using it is all the control I have. I don't I don't have the ability to control their um, uh, like a retail location or point of purchase displays or other ways of informing them. I've got my website and the product. Um, which is the, so this is um, you you can direct sell not using the internet so you can direct sell through mail order or um, or by phone sales and catalogs the uh, now indirect means I'm going to use it the advantage of a distributor so this this means I'm going to take somebody who either either in my uh, domestic market or in the foreign market is going to control the distribution um, so this means I've got another another company who's part of my supply chain and getting my or part of my distribution uh, channel and getting product to the to the customer it means I have to navigate that relationship so now I'm getting into uh, I have to decide is that a contractual relationship is it um, something where we actually want to share equity in what we're doing we'll talk about those formations in just a sec <clears throat> so uh, by contract, right? If if uh, if I have a contract with the distributor, that's going to spell out the terms of you know, for every unit that gets sold. This is how much it, it costs, or maybe I have a, a a retainer where they need I need to pay them a certain amount uh, just for their services, and then we we work on how much uh, uh, the volume of goods that are are uh, distributed through their channel. the The main point about this is that this is a legal agreement, right? This creates a um, a scenario where the potential for the U.S. and Germany pork liver case study um, comes into play. We could dispute about the contract. We need to decide if the contract is going to be entered into uh, in the home market or in the foreign market. Um, but we're not talking about an equity association. In other words, I don't own the distributor. The distributor doesn't own me. And, me, and um, all we're doing is uh, contracting to do parts of this business operation of getting goods and services into the hands of the customer. So what does it involve if it doesn't involve equity? Well, oftentimes this is a transfer of tech. Um, maybe the by this arrangement the distributor gets to take advantage of my point of purchase uh, um, or my point of sale um, computer system for selling goods and services. Maybe I get to take advantage of theirs. Maybe they have a a, a network of of uh, customers and and uh, retailers that I'm taking advantage of there. What uh, the manufacturing process, the brand, right? What all the investment that I've made in my brand now the distributor gets to tap into that as they sell my product um, in their home market, uh, and other other human oriented things, but not equity. Now um, a flavor of contracts is licensing. So if you think about this, think about uh, think about uh, Disney. Um, you can buy you know, anything in the world almost. Um, you can buy toilet paper with Winnie the Pooh on it. Uh, and the way that those agreements work is Disney doesn't control the manufacture of those products. It licenses the use of its its uh, characters and their names. And so um, that's all done on a contractual basis. So that the it's like let's say that I wanted to create uh, a product like hand towels, and I wanted to put um, you know. Star Wars characters on them. Well, Disney owns the Star Wars franchise now, so um, I'm going to go to them, and they're going to take a cut. Every product that I sell, they're going to take a cut of of that for using their name. What's the advantage to me? I get to have Darth Vader on my hand towels, um, and and as long as that relationship holds, um, that's that could be a win-win. Advantages: um, It doesn't cost very much to do this. Uh, a lot of times, having the um, distributor. So, for instance, if I if I'm a, if I'm a distributor in Japan and I'm selling Disney licensed goods, I don't have to worry about you know I may manufacture them right there in Japan, and I slap Disney's name on them. All I do is send some money back to the Disney mothership, and my products didn't have to worry about import issues. They didn't have to worry about taxes or duties because they're all made in country. Um, the risk that Disney has with that is okay. I'm going to uh, make a contract with you, you're going to create these goods, and then you're going to deliver a bad customer experience. Since Disney has mostly just characters, um, it's the a bad customer experience doesn't uh, reflect so much on them as it does on the manufacturer of the good. Everybody knows that, that Disney licenses its stuff. Um, but that's the risk. 
uh, if you pick a bad distribution partner or a, a bad partner in any in any part of the distribution channel, uh, you have you have problems with uh, what does that do to how does that affect your brand, and you have problems with if you have quality or customer service issues. All of those things can reflect poorly on you. Um, you may have poor execution, which means that that uh, the only reason you did this in the first place was was with the hope of making money. Well the poor execution of your distribution partner may make it where you, you don't make any money. Now franchises are a special category of contract um, uh, business. So a franchise works, uh, you've, and you've seen these, right? Like McDonald's, Burger King, these are common franchises. If you've ever read uh, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, this is a, a great marketing book, I recommend it. Um, talks a lot about systematizing your processes and ultimately recommends the franchising model. In a franchise model, if I if I go out and, and buy a McDonald's franchise, right, I'm going to pay for the I'm going to pay for the, the franchise. I may I may own the real estate, I may not, um, but I uh, what I do get is the right to to sell McDonald's stuff from that location. Um, I don't have the right to go out and say, well, you know what, I could get uh, I could get my paper cups cheaper from this other source, but they don't say McDonald's on them. They don't have the golden arches. Well, that's I'm not allowed to do that, right? My franchise agreement means I get all my food from McDonald's. I get all my all my paper goods. I get, you know, all my branding uh, is coming from McDonald's. But what do I get for giving up that control? I get all the money in advertising that McDonald's spends to build its brand worldwide. So when people come to my uh, restaurant, they they know the experience that they are getting. And McDonald's is is locked into the idea that that they want to deliver a consistent experience wherever you go. And you find that there are there are some exceptions where McDonald's adapts their menu to local tastes and things like that, but but you know, a Big Mac in London tastes pretty much the same as a Big Mac in New York. The um, important thing to note about franchises is how fast it's growing. Um, people are leveraging this business model uh, for rapid growth. Uh, a good example of this would be um, Chipotle, right? Chipotle is, uh, as a um, like setting aside their uh, E. coli issues, uh, Chipotle has grown as a as a brand in really only two or three years, um, and and so they've been able using franchises to just grow ex explosively. So another thing I could do is create a strategic alliance. Here, here we're going to say, hey, uh, you your company's over there, my company's over here. We think that if we work together on uh, either selling this product or delivering this service, that we could do something that would uh, be beneficial to both of us. You know, a good example of this might be uh, Starbucks and United Airlines. So Starbucks, uh, United Airlines says, hey, uh, we have a lot of our uh, people who fly with us that drink coffee, and uh, Starbucks, you you have this uh, awesome brand for, for coffee and, and all of this education around uh, the quality of your coffee beans and how... how uh, how you roast them and, and everything else. And so United and Starbucks cut this cut a deal to where the only coffee served on United flights was Starbucks. Um, and that was a, an alliance that neither of them were in competing businesses, so it was a it was a, a mutually beneficial relationship uh, that worked for both of them. Um, sometimes you uh, well this is the Starbucks examples works good here too. Um, United may not be great at brewing coffee. Um, that's not their main thing. Their main thing is operating airlines. So uh, teaming up with somebody who that is their strength um, may be the right, uh, the right way to put a deal like this together. Um, so why, what motivates this? It's opportunity. Opportunity is what drives uh, strategic alliances. That both parties can see that there's an opportunity to make money and serve customers in a new market, and that that by doing it together, they have a their their combined benefit is is greater than their ability to do either um, on their own. Okay, that takes us to joint ventures. Now we're entering into the the territory where we um, we're talking about equity. In a joint venture, the two uh, the two companies actually create a new legal entity. It's common for that to be an SP an SPE or an SPV, a special purpose entity or a special purpose vehicle. Um, both of the parent companies own a stake in the new company, um, and it doesn't mean that you've granted ownership of either parent company to the to the other. You just are, have equity in the new company that represents your joint venture, and that new company is now going to 
to uh, go and do business and have the advantage of relationships directly to the parent company. Um, the, uh, a, an expanded version of joint ventures is consortia. So a consortium is uh, like a joint venture, it's an equity, uh, an equity deal, but oftentimes you have multiple companies that are, are combining to enter, uh, uh, an, to enter a market where none of them are currently active. So you wouldn't create a consortium in order to go to a market where one of you already has a presence. Um, but you would use it to combine forces and enter a market that is new to all of the, all of the members. Um, and all of these deals are designed to take advantages of the, uh, all of these structures are designed to take advantages of what each party brings to the table. Um, and, and that uh, inherently reduces risk, right? If you're strong in one thing, I'm strong in another. If we team up, then I don't have the risk of failing because of the area where I am not strong. Okay, then the, the last one is direct foreign investment. This is where I have 100% of the equity. I go to, uh, and I'm, I might make a, a separate company to do this, or I might uh, just do a, um, I might take my, my parent company and operate in the new market, and I'm going to pour money in there. I'm going to build factories. I'm going to hire people. I'm going to rent storefronts. I'm going to build inventory. I'm going to have uh, inventory shipped into the, to the, uh, the new market. And, and I have total control over that. Um, there, I don't have to worry about my partner messing things up, right? I, I'm going to do it myself. Um, but the risk is I have total risk as well. If the, co the country decides to shut me down or they pass legislation that, that wipes me out um, or the customer isn't receptive to my product and I, and I can't make money, nobody buys, um, all of those things create a risk that I bear alone. Um, and so that's the that's the risk. But all of these all of these forms of um, entering a market are uh, are active. Like there's not there's not uh, it's not that one is rare. They all of these things are happening in common. Um, but it depends on your appetite for risk and which which um, form you think has the best chance of success. Um, you guys can read this on your own. Okay, so let's think about the org chart. Right. If I'm going to have uh, an international presence and a domestic domestic presence, how do I organize and structure um, the people who are doing the work? So in this case, uh, there's a couple of things to highlight that that illustrate strengths and weaknesses of various types of international marketing organizations. So in this case, the VP of marketing up at the top, the VP is the the top ranking marketing person in the company. Um, underneath that, there are two marketing directors. In this case, one is focused on passenger cars, one on trucks. And then each of those directors has a manager underneath them focused on different areas. It's really common to have like in North America, South America, um, Asia, and then a lot of times uh, there will be EMEA, which is an acronym for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, companies are are getting a little bit um, a little bit wise to kind of breaking that up because you know, what does, uh, what does Sub-Saharan Africa have in common with the Middle East, which has in common with Scandinavia? Uh, pretty different markets. Usually the reason they do that is because the Middle East and Africa represent small markets, and they're kind of bolted on to uh, the European market. But we see some of that's changing. So uh, whatever that structure is, I've got managers that are uh, assigned by region. So now the question is, uh, ask yourself, why would it be good to have managers that are regional, and why would it be bad? In this case, um, let's let's take a look at the passenger car side. Well, the um, I can't afford for each of these regions to have its own research group, and so I have a separate research group that provides services to all three of these. What if the services are provided unequally? Uh, what if the markets um, what if the markets earn unequally? What if the revenue of, of one is super strong and another is super weak? Does it deserve then more research dollars allocated to it? Um, and the question about how you split that pie of uh, of combined services and also how you view the um, the competitive nature, the differences of each region are uh, fodder for discontent. Now, it could be that I had the some you know one person in charge of all of these, in which case uh, the the um, the risks there are that that person doesn't understand the the details of each individual market. Um, so the strengths of of having your market broken up like this are that you get on the ground detailed understanding of the nuances of what's happening in each market. 
the um, but the the disadvantage is you may have competition for scarce resources, um, and there may be uh, room for discontent. And maybe you have uh, in this case uh, we have passenger cars and trucks. Maybe trucks or passenger cars are stronger or weaker in one market versus another, and that creates another uh, variance that's a, that's a potential conflict. That takes us to phase four. So we got we evaluated the market. We took a deep look. We decided uh, what structure we wanted to use to enter the market, and now the, the um, question is about execution. So how do we actually implement our, the plan that we made in phase three? Well, we got some decisions to make. One is, um, in the structure that we've built, where does the decision-making authority lie? And one of the things uh, that you get with decision-making authority is, is what type of decisions. So um, the, the two options are decisions could be made uh, from the mothership, right? The, the parent company directs all decisions downstream. I'm um, a good example of this. I was at a conference recently where um, they were talking about uh, Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce.com. Uh, the the uh, speaker was in charge of training new salespeople for Salesforce.com, and he said when a new initiative would come down from Mark Benioff, he would say, "Look, here's this is the new approach. Um, everybody in the company has 30 days to be on message." Uh, and now it's up to you to train them to make sure that everybody's everybody's on message. Well, that's a that's a command and control top down type of decision making. What's the advantage? Everybody's on message. You have consistency, you know, top to bottom throughout the country or throughout the company. What's the disadvantage? Um, well, there may be information that lives at the bottom level that doesn't make it up to the top. So, as we look at this, where does decision authority lie? Well, what type of decisions are we talking about? Are we talking about management decisions, hiring, firing decisions? Are we talking about budget decisions? Do I allow um, my managers on the ground full discretion in terms of they want to go buy an ad or they want to go do a co-branding uh, activity? They want to spend some money to, uh, that they think matches what, what works in their country? Or do budget decisions have to be kicked upstream? And then who's responsible for keeping the strategy of our marketing um, cohesive and, and con for keeping continuity. <clears throat> so centralized means top-down. Um, in that case, it's usually the advantage is about control, consistency. Um, you want, uh, that way you can hire, if you only have so big of a budget to hire your executives, you're going to hire your top people um, to be in the central location so that you can take their talents and abilities and spread them downstream across the entire company. Decentralized, on the other hand, allows um, autonomy and flexibility for the local managers. They, they have information that takes time to percolate up and may imperfectly be translated up, uh, up to the, the mothership. So they, with that information, the more autonomy we give them, the more they are going to be able to um, use that information quickly uh, for the benefit of the company. And ultimately, that's the, that's the question where somewhere in the spectrum your decision making will fall and you just need to make decisions about where you think that will be best. Okay, that's the end of chapter 12. As we move into chapter 13, quote of the week here from Joe Chernov, who's the currently the VP of Marketing Insight Squared, former VP of Content Marketing for HubSpot, if you're familiar with uh, the marketing automation tool HubSpot. Good marketing makes the company look smart. Great marketing makes the customer feel smart. Think about that for a second. Cliff notes for chapter 13, B2C, of course, means business to consumer. Um, as, the, as we get more and more markets that are developed, <clears throat> one of the results of that is that consumers in mature markets have more purchasing power and therefore more complex tastes. So what does that mean? It means that there's enough consumers within, with enough purchasing power that you can create a company that does things that are very niche very um, nuanced, um, and that's okay. A good way to think about this is think about what products, what hair care products you use. Um, do you buy shampoos and conditioners that are super cheap, um, or, and, or do you buy more expensive hair care products because of, of what you think they, they do for your hair? Um, in a, an underdeveloped market, you have few choices. But if you go to the if you go to the store, go to, to the salon to buy your, your hair care products, you've got lots and lots of choices. And that's the result of being in a mature market where consumers have a lot of purchasing power. The trend is as bigger firms the bigger firms get, they they always kind of lean towards being uh, global in their orientation because it's 
it um, creates so many economies of scale, um, then usually they get faced somewhere along the line with how global um, can we be. So in order to figure out what's right in the new market, we need to kind of get as granular as we can be. We're going to start by asking the simple question of what is a product? And think about this for a second. When I ask you what's a product, what comes to mind? The definition that, uh, that I want to share with you is this. A product is something that empowers consumers to do something they couldn't do before. And that, might, that thing might be really important, like, you know, it allows me to eat and not starve to death, allows me to, you know, live in a house where I'm, I'm warm and safe. Um, or it could be something super ephemeral, something uh, like, hey, I was entertained for a few seconds because I saw something online. Um, a product doesn't care about the meaningfulness of what it empowers the consumer to be, but it, uh, it empowers them to, to do or experience something that they couldn't before. And the way it does that is through its collection of attributes. So when we break a product down into its, into its constituent attributes, we can look at each attribute and see if they're suitable for entry into the new market. To make it suitable, we'll break it down and understand the parts. So let's take a look at Coca-Cola. We'll break it into three parts. The first one is the core product. This is the actual beverage. This is the magic formula kept in the vault in Atlanta, right? This is, is the, the taste and flavors and constituency of, of the beverage of Coke. But what about the packaging? Doesn't the packaging also become part of the product? Uh, for Coke, we can take the silhouette of this bottle shape and put it almost anywhere in the world and people will understand um, what, what that means. Or take the swoosh underneath their, their, um, their logo. And almost any place in the world, these, this combination of, of packaging um, is a significant part of the product. In fact, um, so recently in a uh, lawsuit at the Supreme Court of the United States between Apple and Samsung, Apple is suing Samsung for um, uh, copying some of their designs. Um, they sometimes will call this trade dress. So they're saying, hey, Samsung, some of your phones are copying things that we developed and designed at Apple. Um, and Samsung's like, well, yeah, you can't, you can't patent these things. These things are, are generic and universal, and you can't own them. And the, there was a, a, a group of about 100 industrial designers, so these are people who focus on the, des the design of products, um, filed an amicus brief in favor of Apple saying, look, design and packaging are intrinsic to the user's experience uh, of the product. Uh, and so that's just an interesting example about how packaging um, is being defended as, as an essential piece of the product. And then also what services go along with the product. Um, Sometimes services can deliver as much value or more than the, than the core product itself. So each of these three items we need to look at for suitability in terms of entering the new market. Um, the other thing is you've got to understand that, that uh, products and their value is determined by the consumer. So it's not just how a product is used, but it's the perception between, uh, between how it's used. And when we look at introducing a new product, it's going to be the perceptions about how that product relates to what's already in the market. Um, and it, will the product be, and its, its, um, its core components be suitable as they are, or do we need to make some changes? I mean, a good example for this might be, um, maybe we have a food product, and in order to introduce it into Europe, we're going to need to use European standards for nutritional information and labeling. It's it probably doesn't have a huge impact on, um, on the use of the product itself, but now it's adapted to fit what's expected in the foreign market. Part of the things we have to deal with is country of origin effect. So there's a perception that products um, have, they may have a quality advantage, it could be positive or negative, it could be, um, it could be the um, use by celebrities or other things, but it's tied into the country where the product comes from. So think about right now. Think about if there are products where you know where they come from and you feel like that is either positive or negative. I'm going to give you a few examples. So here we have an example of positive country of origin effects. We've got French wines, German beer, uh, Irish woolens, and Swiss watches, right? Thanks to Leo DiCaprio for showing off the Tag Heuer watch. Um, and all of these things tie into uh, country of origin effects. What about country of origin effects that are negative? So this, you know, a lot of you guys are too young to remember when this was a thing, but 
Um, when I was a kid, the Yugo was, was this was the cheap alternative uh, vehicle. Um, and the, the big joke at the time was, uh, hey, Yugo's coming out with a station wagon that we call the Wego. The thing about country of origin effects is that they're not usually data-driven. Country of origin effects can be affected by stereotypes, ethnocentrism, um, economic development, fads, experience, hearsay, and myth. You can't get further away from data than myth. Um, and so, be that as it may, this is, these are real things that exist in the minds of your consumers. So you have to kind of reckon with that and decide, okay, is there going to be a, a country of origin effect that is going to help us or that's going to hurt us in relationship to all three of the, of the components of your product? And so we're back to the, the question of adaptation and standardization. Do we need to, um, can we standardize? Are we going to be fine if we, if we do? Or are we going to have to make some adaptations in order for the, the product to suit? Adaptations, the advantage is we potentially could get a better product market fit. We could get uh, our, our product might nail the consumer demand uh, in exactly the right way and, and could be wildly successful because of that fit. The advantage of standardization is you know, it's going to cost us a lot less to have to set up a separate manufacturing process for, um, for each market versus just setting up one that we can we can churn out all of our products, and ultimately, um, as you ask yourself the question about do I is do I standardize do I adapt in the new market, it may be that this analysis says you shouldn't introduce the product at all, uh, that it's it's either too difficult to know what the right decision is, or making the adaptations or trying to standardize won't work. Okay, <clears throat> so. We kind of started at the bottom with the essence of the product, looked at what it would take to, to introduce the product, evaluate the suitability of the, of the uh, product's constituent parts. Um, and now uh, the standardization versus adaptation question gets asked at each of these levels as our company grows. It's super common for the first way uh, that a, com a company expands into a new market is to take the same product that it has been using in its existing market. And that's, what's, uh, that's what we're talking about here with domestic market extension. We're taking the same pro product that we made at home. We're going to you know, ship it overseas and see how it goes. Um, the next step in evolution from there is multi-domestic. So here we're going to say, okay, we know that our current product mostly works, but we need a few tweaks. So now we're going to keep this, that product the same at home, but make a new strategy around how we introduce it for the new markets. And then global is ultimately uh, global is the ultimate standardization. This is Coca-Cola. This is where we, we are able to develop a marketing strategy and uh, in our product that effect that effectively works in all markets. So, as we look at at uh, country of origin effects, um, sometimes those can be product specific rather than country specific. So sometimes it's just a country's specific product that we think is awesome, not necessarily everything that comes from, the, from that country. For example, uh, Cuban cigars. Well, Cuban cigars are supposed to be awesome. Um, I don't smoke cigars, so I don't know, but um, other things from Cuba, like just because Cuban cigars are awesome doesn't mean that everything from Cuba is awesome. So we got a, the question there is now we're looking at product specific. Or what about English tea? Does that mean that everything from England is awesome? Or Italian leather, right? Does that mean everything from Italy is awesome? Or, or uh, French perfume, does that mean everything in France is awesome? <clears throat> this might interest you. So a survey was done in the Czech Republic about country of origin effects for these countries. They viewed Japanese goods as of the highest quality. U.S., unfortunately, is down near the bottom at 29%. And, and who knows why this is? This could have been, uh, I mean, the U.S. makes really high quality goods and also really crappy goods. Um, maybe the Czech Republic is importing more crappy goods than, than high quality goods. Um, maybe it just has to do with uh, external factors, right? The emotional things that, uh, like, like fads, myths, um, it could have to do with political uh, views between the two countries. Um, who knows? So again, like some, I'm sure you've seen J.D. Power and Associates. You know, uh, the car companies love to trot these out. Hey, you know, we won the J.D. Power Associates uh, award for for customer satisfaction. Ultimately, customer satisfaction is determined by the customer. Um, quality is determined by the customer. So even if you can argue, it's like, look, our product was uh, our product was machined to a better tolerance than the competitive product. Um, if the whole package 
the product, the, the packaging, and the services um, don't compete, that, that, that data may be meaningless in terms of, of how quality is perceived by the customer. Um, this is also, if you're unfamiliar with the Net Promoter Score, uh, Net Promoter Score is a really common customer satisfaction index that's used uh, right now. Um, it was introduced in a Harvard Business Review article where they had done a study that essentially said, look, this one question determines more about your, uh, your customer's true satisfaction than any other. And the question was, how likely are you to recommend our product to a friend? Um, and the scale is always rated on 1 to 10, sometimes simplified as to 1 to 5, but mostly 1 to 10. Um, and scores of 9 to 10 are considered promoters. Scores of 7 to 8 are considered neutral, and scores of 1 to 6 are considered detractors. So what they do, they, they survey, they take all the promoters and all the detractors, sum them up, and get your net promoter score. Um, and ultimately, what they're saying is that if your uh, net, pro the higher your net promoter score is, the more satisfied your customers are. To give you an idea about this, I think uh, Apple has a net promoter score uh, I think in the low 70s, which is super high. Um, uh, Comcast on the other hand has a net promoter score of somewhere around negative three. Um, here's a, uh, another example of specific adaptation. So this is, a, this is in Russia. Uh, I have never actually seen this product on the shelf, but supposedly in Moscow the, the chocolate on the left um, is specifically sold as chocolate for men. Um, no idea what that actually means, but in, in Moscow apparently it works. Now, maybe you don't want to adapt, but you have a requirement to adapt. So um, government regulations might require changes, like the nutrition label thing that I mentioned. That could be a, a requirement. You, you've just got to do it if you want to sell. Um, and the term is homologation. Homologation is describing um, all of the changes you have to make for your product to meet local standards. Notice the little test question icon down there. This, this may appear uh, on one of the tests. Um, so there could be legal requirements, right? Political requirements where you've got, you have to match certain legislation. Um, you might have technological requirements like I think we've talked about before that the, the EU, um, there, are, there are many entities inside the EU that require that customer data be stored on servers actually physically located in Europe. Um, this, this is driven primarily by the um, information that came out about the NSA spying on American citizens. Well, the Europeans don't want to get spied on by the NSA, so they require that their customer data gets um, stored on servers in Europe. It, it also could be something that is um, adapting to the climate. Like, this, this isn't uh, a man-made requirement. It's just physically required in order to make your product work in a new country. Could be lubrications, could be... Um, stabilizers or other things uh, could be uh, dealing with humidity, other things to have so, so that your product functions in the target market. Now, typically, the less economically developed a country, the greater the degree of change that a product will need for acceptance. What, what you have is, is that um, less economically developed countries, the people are generally more isolated, less interaction with, uh, with other things, and so they're more um, inclined to see things that fit their, uh, their own culture as acceptable versus um, being foreign and, and uh, outside the norm. They also might have environmental concerns. Um, these could be concerns that are, that are also regulatory, or they might just be driven by, uh, by consumers' desire to be environmentally responsible. Um, Germany, I think, just a uh, year or two ago, passed uh, one of the, the strictest environmental regulations around packaging. Um, it had to do with, with um, the amount of recycled content in your packaging and the ability for your recycling to be, uh, to be recycled. Or sorry, the ability for your packaging to be recycled. Um, and this, sometimes this can go down to, to even the, the inks you use on your packaging. You know, are they, how are they, they manufactured and, and uh, how recyclable are their components? Um, so now we come to the idea of... Uh, I'm, introducing something new. All of your country notebook assignments uh, are around the idea of introducing something that doesn't yet exist. So when we look at um, the, the social impact of introducing something new, we're, we're talking about the success of an innovation. And combined with the innovation is diffusion. How does the idea spread when you, when you uh, reach the target market? 
there's more than one way that things move around inside a target market. Um, and some of the variables are these. How new is it perceived? Does uh, the attributes, do we, do we understand and un uh, you know, do we know what this thing does or what it promises to do? Uh, and how is it communicated? How do we find out about it and how do we, uh, how do we tell others about it? This guy's named Everett Rogers and he introduced the uh, innovation adoption life cycle, which you've probably seen uh, flavors of this many times uh, in your lives. Uh, he introduced the concept of innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. Um, and so these things originate with him. This was followed up on by Jeffrey Moore. Jeffrey Moore is one is a name that, that uh, especially for those of you guys who are marketing majors, you should know who he is. He introduced a book called Crossing the, Ch the Chasm, uh, gosh, like 20 years ago, where he noted that for technology products, this um, gap between early adopters and early majority, the innovators and early adopters was an easy uh, market to catch uh, or to capture with a new technology product. But being able to get that product into the early majority uh, was really tough. And so he, he wrote a book about just what it takes to get that, to get that done. Now, uh, one of the key concepts that Rogers uh, introduce is that people don't automatically adopt a new product. Like it's not like you just show up and without anything happening people just use it. They have to make a decision. So something happens in the minds of people who are adopting a new product. And so he, um, in order to kind of get quantitative about this, he developed the five characteristics uh, of an innovation. That These are keys to how um, uh, an innovation is received. One is the relative advantage. How much better is it? How much better was the iPhone than the, the Motorola Razr, for example? Um, does it fit with how I see myself in the world? Does using this product match with my ideas about, about how, what products I should use or, what, what, uh, or who I am? Is it hard? Is it hard to figure this out or is it easy to use? How tough is it to try? Is it something I can pick up and try? Is there a social risk attached to this? I like to think about the, the first person who ever put in like a, you know, a Jawbone Bluetooth uh, headset. It's like, okay, you've got this antenna sticking out of your ear and now you're, uh, you look like you're talking to invisible people. Um, was that a tough, was there some social risk attached with the first guy who tried the Jawbone? In fact, I recently read an article about somebody who felt the same way about the new uh, Apple AirPods, right? Felt like, hey, um, you know, I got these little white kickstands sticking out of my ear, and I'm feeling a little bit uh, lonely about that. But um, as this product gets adopted, I'm going to feel um, more like I'm part of the crowd. And then observability: is it easy to look at it, understand what it uh, what it does, and how to use it, um, and why I should? If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. 
If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. So um, you, you saw in the video, that's a great microcosm of how an, an innovation is diffused. Um, you saw first the, the dancing guy, and as people you know, came in, it, in, in two minutes, you got to see the entire um, process for how a new product or a new idea um, gets, uh, gets diffused into a, uh, a market. Um, there's another example I like to talk about, and that's Red Bull. So one of the strategies that Red Bull used early on, nobody knew about Red Bull. Um, they were brand new, and so they had people go into clubs in New York and leave empty crushed Red Bull cans on the floor of the bathrooms as a way that people would say, oh man, it looks like there's people are drinking Red Bull in this, in this hot club. Um, that was one of the ways that they got people to accept that Red Bull wasn't this, uh, th they got people to assume that people were drinking Red Bull. So when we think about um, core product, packaging and services, all of these things have to be addressed as you look at the new market. Let's talk about services for a second. So, or, excuse me, that's wrong. Let's talk about how these things relate to each other. Okay, core product in the center. Packaging, and you can see that we're starting to touch on some of our marketing mix uh, elements, price and package, price and package, and then ultimately services wrap uh, over all that. And it could be that services um, for some products, services represent a bigger revenue um, generator than even the core pr product itself. In some ways, this is kind of like the printers and ink model or the razors and razor blades model. The service is continued support, um, where the core product is, okay, I have a razor. <clears throat> and in services, you have a lot of the same issues you have with hard goods. They're complicated by the fact that you could include characteristics like intangible, inseparable, heterogeneous, and perishable. So let's say, let's say that, um, what does perishable mean? Well, it means that it goes away. So it's, we're not just talking about food spoiling. It could be my Uber ride from the airport to my hotel, right? When I get to the hotel, my Uber ride is over. It's done. It has, it has perished. Um, it is intangible. I cannot grab a hold of it uh, and say, well, hey, check this out. This, I'm holding my Uber ride here in my hand. Um, it's, there's no way that I can separate the service of pulling out the Uber app, getting a ride. There's no way I can separate those components out. The, they, all, um, they all jumble together into, the, into this heterogeneous amalgam of the experience. So that makes services sometimes a little more complex. And we've got to look at each of these things and how these need to be adapted or um, standardized for new markets as well. Here's some example of service uh, industries. Tourism. Transportation, uh, like like the Uber example I just gave, uh, definitely air travel is a, is a service-oriented business. Uh, financial services, right? If I buy insurance, um, you know, what do I get? If I uh, if I do an international exchange, um, it it ends. Um, education, right? When I get education, it's it's intangible. I can't say, look, here's I've got my education here in my hand. Uh, telecommunications, entertainment, information, and healthcare. So we've talked about these principles uh, uh, pretty thoroughly before, so I'm not going to spend time here, but just think about uh, about all of the issues, all the barriers uh, to trade. They apply to services just like they do to regular products. Um, and this is, you can tell that this slide is old because Kodak is still listed as, as a global brand, but um, this is one of the things that, that companies do is like these big companies they invest a ton in their brand let's take a look at some examples so here's 2015 these are the top 25 brands in 2015 
and think about how many of these you expect to be there, how many you don't. For me, some of the surprises were um, like Cisco and Oracle, right? Big Silicon Valley companies, but kind of B2B focused. Um, don't think about those quite so much as consumer brands, but yet they still uh, they still ranked. Uh, 2016, here's how things changed. Um, also, I, I didn't have time to update this slide, but in 2017, um, Google has now replaced Apple as the number one brand um, in the world. Um, so that's part of the question you have is, is do you really want to go for a global brand? This is a question that happens when you're big, too. This isn't a startup question. Um, do you want to go for a global, global brand? Or is a national brand more in line with what you want? Um, can you actually capture the economies of scale? Can you actually, um, uh, do you actually have development costs advantages? Or, uh, or are there development costs that you're going to have to find some way to pay for? Um, is it easier? Is it easier to just promote a single product? Um, how tough is it to build awareness of your brand? You may have incredible brand strength in one market, but you've got to build that from scratch in another. Um, what if you have multiple brands? Like some examples of this are um, uh, <clears throat> like Axe Body Spray. So Axe Body Spray is sold in the United States under the Axe brand, but in the UK it's sold under the Lynx brand. Well, what if I have overlap somewhere where I have to pay to market uh, or, or pay to advertise both brands? Well, now I'm, I'm essentially double paying on what's this, what is the equivalent of the same product. Um, and then can I maintain the same level of prestige for the product in, uh, in both markets? Uh, you know, in the, in the video about uh, China, we saw that uh, China was good at knocking off cars. Here's an example. Um, you know, does the brand matter? Does the Chevy brand matter so much that, uh, that in the new market people are willing to pay more for the Chevy than for the exact knockoff? Um, so um, the next, and I've got a video to show that, so Disney had this problem. Um, Disney uh, created High School Musical. My kids are really excited that, that they're building a, or that they're making a High School Musical 4. Um, Disney wanted to take High School, Mu High School Musical to the Indian market. And here's an example of what they did.
you think about the challenges of taking something that is so culturally specific um, and trying to transplant it into a new market, uh, this is a pretty, a pretty um, ambitious product or ambitious project for Disney. Okay, what about, I'm going to talk real quick about generics. What about uh, private brands that retailers own? So um, I love this image on the right because a lot of times that's what people think about when they think about branding. It's like, just we just want to stick your logo on stuff. And without branding, the world would look like this. Um, I think that's totally false, right? Your brand isn't about having your logo on stuff. Um, it's not like that all of your products are cattle and you need to brand them. Um, what Where your brand lives is in the mind of your customer. So all of the experiences that your customer has, that's what your brand is. And you don't actually control it. Um, you, know, you're, you can influence it by delivering positive experiences. But if they have a bad experience, that's part of your brand too. Because your brand doesn't live external to your customer. It's about the space you occupy in their minds. Well, so these store brands are coming out and they're saying, well, maybe we could introduce a competitive product because the brand that we're competing against may not be that strong. Or it might not be so strong that, that consumers are willing to pay more for it. Um, particularly strong in Europe, check this out, right? 30% of the British and Swiss markets uh, are store brands. 20% of French and German markets are store brands. This is, these are the great values of the world, right? Walmart's store brand. Um, and if you're entering a market, you need to know if there's a store brand that is already competing with your product because there's going to be some advantages that the, that the private label brand has over yours. In, advantages in distribution that the, the company is already paying for. Advantages in terms of uh, shelf space, advantages in terms of margins. Um, the, the, uh, the private brands are really competitive. So you have to, you just have to be aware about if this is something that, that your product has to compete against. And if, you, if so, how are you, what's your strategy to do that? Okay, we're going to finish up chapter 13 with this. This is an article that I, I wrote a year or so ago. Um, about writing the perfect brand positioning statement. As you guys look at, uh, this is the formula, as you guys look at um, getting jobs after you graduate, uh, if you're looking for marketing jobs, being able to articulate the brand positioning statement of the product for the company that you're going to work for give you a huge advantage. Um, so here's how it breaks down. The brand positioning statement says this, for, insert the target customer, who, this is what they need, our product, delivers this benefit, and that's because we have this secret sauce. So let me give you an example of uh, scrubbing bubbles. So scrubbing bubbles, right, this is a bathroom cleaner, and it's got little animated uh, little cartoon bubbles on the front. And so think about this. For people who clean their homes, people who clean their bathrooms, who need this job to be easier, um, we deliver our product, which helps make cleaning easier. Um, that's because we got scrubbing bubbles. So think about the that's because the most important part of this, the first part is the nuts and bolts. You need to understand who it's for, what the product is, and what it does. You know, what problem does it solve for them? But the last part is where all of the sexiness of, of selling a product comes in. That's because we got some secret sauce. Now, the scrubbing bubbles doesn't actually have you know, little animated uh, bubble scrubber people. Um, it's got, it's got chemical cleaners, just like all the other cleaners do. But the marketing is around a story of here's why this product makes your life easier. And think about this. Think about this for any product. Um, if you can articulate this formula, articulate a brand positioning statement for any product that you use in your, in your own life, um, understanding it will put you in a better position when you go to work for, for a company. Understand who you're talking to. Who's our, who, are we, um, who are we advertising to? And what is the magic thing that we're delivering to them?